Well, last Sunday afternoon, as is captured on some video evidence that has been published on the Lakeside Community Church Facebook account, and if you don't follow along, you can find that page at facebook.com slash Lakeside Algoma. I was engaged in an arm wrestling battle uh, against a man child who uh, weighs in at three and a quarter, and uh, I'm not quite half of that. I'm, I'm, I'm more than half of that, but not, not by a, a whole lot. And so um, I, I lost, but I just want to set the record straight publicly that I had boots on, and it was very slippery. And had, and had I had on better footwear... Elijah Ritchie, you, you, may get, you may get all the scholarship offers to go play football, buddy, on the O-line, but the power in these guns would still take you down, all right? I'm just, I want to set the record straight here once and for all that it was, a, it was a footwear issue, and I had no traction, and it had no bearing whatsoever on what the pythons that only, that only Hulk Hogan could outdo, all right? that I possess under this shirt, and I'm not going to flex for you all right now because I don't want to embarrass any of you gentlemen out there, but they're there, all right? They're there. My lovely wife, Brooklyn, would attest to that, but she's a very modest woman, so she may say they're not, but they are. <laughs> they are. And if I had more traction, I'd have easily defeated Elijah. We had a great time, notwithstanding that small that small blimp on the radar of a defeat in arm wrestling. We had a great time last Sunday at our Sunday fun day as we went sledding, got home with, the, with, uh, with Brooke and the boys, and I look at my phone, and I have 37 missed, uh, missed messages. And I'm in a, a text group that I've talked about a, a couple months ago that's just a great text group and, and it, all kinds of sporting talk and, and all kinds of wonderful things. And they were just Hitting, us, hitting one another up, just absolutely shocked as the initial reports came in about Kobe Bryant's passing away. And as is common in the Twitter age, the initial reports oftentimes are a little cloudy and, and they're a little murky and there's a lot of disinformation. And so a couple hours later, once everybody had time to set the record straight, we were faced with reports. And it caught a lot of people, as, as you saw the response this week nationally, even people who weren't sports fans, but this, this really transcended sporting. And it really, anytime there's, there's somebody of that magnitude who passes away unexpectedly, it causes us all just to, just to take inventory of our life and what's really important. And the reports, they just continued to, to come in. And the more time there was, there was more information. And it could allow people to have whatever response that they would settle upon. For the last month, we've been looking at the book of 1 Corinthians, and we're going to continue that today. So if you have your phones or your tablets, you can follow along with us in the Bible app. It's a free download in your app store, whether you have an Apple product or an Android product. And we would, we would really recommend you go and just, just search Bible. You can download it absolutely free. There are hundreds of translations available. There are reading plans available that take you anywhere from a verse a day up through a few chapters. It is just a phenomenal resource, and it's all completely free. I also want to throw this out. If you're like, I, I, that sounds great, Brian, but I don't do technology. And if you want a Bible and you don't have a Bible, come see me afterwards, and you'll walk out of here today with a Bible because we are, so, we are just so convinced that lives change when we connect with God, and the greatest way to connect with God is through Scripture. Scripture, and so we want to make it as easy as possible as we can for you. So if you're technology savvy and you haven't already, we really recommend you download the Bible app. And if you don't do technology, that's cool. Just come see me, and it would be no greater joy than for, for you to walk out with a brand new Bible. It's all yours. You don't have to bring it back. It doesn't say property of Lakeside Community Church, so everybody thinks you stole it. Uh, and, and by the way, if you do find any of those, steal them anyway. We're never going to be mad at somebody for stealing the Bible, all right? But we just, we just want you to engage. But this morning, as we continue our look at this letter that a guy named Paul wrote to a church in a town named Corinth, and that's where the name of 1 Corinthians comes, and it wasn't, it wasn't the only letter, so hence the first in the 1 Corinthians this morning, we're going to jump in in 1 Corinthians 5, one, and we're going to see that Paul, who at one point had pastored that church, had heard a disturbing report. And there was enough time that the truth had come out, so he knew exactly how to respond. And here's what he encountered. 
It's actually reported that there is sexually immoral, sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife. This is as disturbing as it gets. And oh, by the way, for anybody who's like, yeah, the Bible is just kind of ancient, just kind of boring, exhibit A, all right? Just go, hey, 1 Corinthians 5.1, let's talk. And what he's saying here is, you guys, you guys are perverts. There's a guy who's sleeping with his stepmom in your church. He says, look at our, in, in the culture in which they lived, it was highly sexualized, much like the culture in which we live. And he says, even look out amongst the culture, and even looking at the culture, there's not acceptance of this. But within, but within your church, people are like, it's cool. It's cool that somebody's sleeping with their stepmom. That's fine. Because what had happened is people had, they had rallied around this idea so heavily that was so prevalent in their culture that we're just accepting we're just loving. Everything's good. Everything's great. And here he's like, understand how messed up this is. Understand how messed up this is. We live in an over-sexualized society, and our culture tells us when it, comes to, when it comes to sexuality, basically, there's one of two responses that people can have. So you can either be a prude or a pervert. That's what our society tells us. It tells us really that there's no middle ground, that you're either going to be a prude who, oh, I don't, I don't like sex, sex is gross, it's disgusting, there's nothing great about that, or you're going to be a pervert, that there's no restrictions and anything goes. And the reality is if we follow God's plan, we as people who follow God's plan should have the most rewarding, abundant sex lives possible. It is a gift that God created for us. And oh, by the way, this is biblical and this is scriptural. And so understand that in a society that tells us, oh, there's only one of two options. You can either be a prude or you could be a pervert, that there's another option. But we have to be willing to follow God's plan, as with anything in our lives, in terms of our sexuality as well. And then he continues and he says this, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. So he says, you, you're arrogant. You have this culture of this, this, this celebratory culture. You celebrate the fact that you've welcomed this, and you're okay with it, and you're accepting, and you're loving, and this is just wonderful. You, you, can, just, you can just sense it. When he gets around his friends, there's a couple attaboys. It's like, well, way to go, you and your stepmom. He says, your culture is one of celebration. He says, this shouldn't be. He says, get them out. Remove them. And so we get to this idea of judgment. Now, I know what you're thinking if you've joined us in the last few weeks or if you've watched along it, and you can find all of our sermons archived on our website, lakeside-church.com, or if you have the YouTube app on your phone, just search Lakeside Algoma, and they're all available right there. And I know what you're thinking, because the, for the last month, we've talked about how important it is for everybody to get along. And even last week, we saw that, that Paul said, I don't even judge myself. I leave that up to God. And now we read this, and we're like, why the difference? What's different? Before I answer that question, I want to be crystal clear on something. I want to be so crystal clear on something. This isn't someone who's struggling with something. This isn't about an issue that somebody is struggling with. This is rather about somebody who has an issue in their life, and rather than struggle with it, they have moved to celebrating it. Rather than it being a struggle in their life, this has become a celebration. The reality is this. For every person who follows Jesus, you are going to struggle with things in your life. There are going to be issues that, and they're different for everybody. My issues aren't your issues, and your issues aren't my issues. And this is where we get in trouble so often because we look, we look at other people's issues and we're like, well, they're really messed up, and we diminish our issues. Or the flip side's true of we elevate our issues and they just become these huge ordeals in our minds that cripple us and we look at everybody else and we just look at their Instagram feed and their Facebook feed and we're like, wow, they have it all together and they have a perfect life and they don't have any troubles in the world and I just, I'm horrible, I'm a horrible person, I can't do anything right and then we just get in that cycle of self-pity self and self-doubt and we can never move out of that. But here's the reality. For every person, 
whether you follow Jesus or not, what, you're going to have struggles in your life. You're going to have issues that you struggle with. But for people who follow Jesus, Jesus doesn't come and instantaneously take those away from us. You're going to have things you struggle with. And this doesn't mean that because you struggle with sin, because you struggle with issues in your life, that you're a horrible person and we're just saying, we're done with you because you have struggles. And that's not what Paul's telling the church in Corinth to do either. But rather he's saying, when it moves from being a struggle to your life to something that you wear as a badge of honor and you celebrate, then it's time to draw the line. Celebration is where we draw the line. Where it's no longer a struggle and you're not even trying to overcome it anymore, but you're just like, well, it's who I am. It's just who I am. And he says, you draw the line there. You draw the line where it's not something anybody's even even willing to work on any longer, but they've just accepted it and said, well, this is me. Like it or not. And he says, that's the point where you draw the line. And let me be clear about this as well. Everyone is welcome at Lakeside. Everyone's welcome at Lakeside. But understand this. Once you start following Jesus, everything changes. We're not talking about, and we're going to see this in a few minutes, we're not talking about people's lives who don't follow Jesus. We expect their lives to look like hell. And we welcome them with open arms. And we're glad that they're here. And our job is to love them and and point them to Jesus. And we're going to see in a a few minutes how how sometimes historically the church has gotten this wrong. But but that's that's not what we're talking about at all. What we're talking about is people who've made the decision to follow Jesus, who boldly proclaim to everybody that they encounter, I'm a, I'm a Christ follower, I'm a Christian, but whose lives still look like hell, and rather than try to do anything about it, just say, well, this is me, and I'm just going to celebrate who I am. And if you're like, whoa, he's not messing around, just wait. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit, and As if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's go home. What? What? You're going to hand somebody over to Satan? What in the world? Does that mean like you're like, you are a demon, right? You're, you're going to go all tele-evangelist on somebody and, and throw... What is he talking about here? What does he mean? It doesn't mean that that person becomes demon-possessed. No, no, no. What he's talking about here is administering love. And you're like, huh? But it's tough love. But it's tough love. Some of you know from, from firsthand experience and, and the heartbreak that you, that you just, you wear and you wouldn't wish it upon your worst enemy. But you've watched as the baby that you held in your arms, who has grown older, has spiraled down into addiction issues. And it breaks your heart every time you walk in the hallway and you see the picture of a little six-year-old boy and a little six-year-old girl with the biggest smiles on their faces, with hope in their eyes. And you remember, you remember that little kid. You remember your favorite vacation. You can close your eyes and you can still see them playing in the sand at the beach or climbing into the tent at the campground. You remember how excited they were to get their license or when they walked across the stage to receive their diploma. And your heart breaks every single day. Because what was once so much potential has become wasted. The smiles are gone. 
They are a shell of who they could be, and it breaks your heart every single day. And as their parent, you would give your life to see them make different choices. You would give anything to see them be able to overcome this addiction and to be made well. And what research and a lot of psychologists and counselors would suggest, not all, but a lot would suggest, is that that addiction, that addiction will never be overcome, it will never be beaten until that person hits rock bottom and really realizes their need to change. And Jesus, in his story, the parable of the prodigal son, to me it's not an accident that he made sure to talk about the plight the son experienced before he came home. And if you've ever dealt with an addict, what you understand is that until they really want to be made well, until they really want to put the work in, until they are fed up and they have had enough, until they hit that point, they're probably not going to change. So what Paul's talking about here is actually loving. In the same way that if your child's an addict, it's not the best situation to continue to give them money. Because you've just enabled them to go buy more. And you may see their circumstances and you may may want to help them. And so you may just throw money thinking this will help them eat. But the reality is their next hit is more important than their next meal. So what Paul's saying here is when somebody's reached the point where they have made the decision to follow Jesus in their lives and they're no longer struggling with something, but they're just wearing it like a badge of honor, their life is out of bounds. And remember, as we saw last week, everything that's done in the recesses of our life, everything that's done in the dark, everything that we think is hidden, we will stand before God one day and give an account about So he says, for the, for the love of this individual, don't be an enabler. Let them go and let them hit rock bottom. And sometimes in order to let them go, you need to help them out a little bit. But it's not because you're angry at them. It's not because you hate them. It's not because you want bad things to befall upon them. You ultimately want them to understand the need to change. That's why this process should never be done in anger. It should never be done in rage. It should never be done because because you're upset at the actions of somebody else. And in fact, if you're a party to that, it's a really good idea for you to get other people involved. That's the model that Jesus tells us in Matthew 18. He says, if somebody wrongs you, go talk to them about it. And then if they don't listen, take somebody else. Now, what can happen a lot of times is what we do is we find somebody that we spilled all of, all of our feelings towards, and we've given them our side of the story along, and then we, it really feels like we're tag, tag teaming up on somebody else. And that's not the right approach. The right approach is to take somebody who's a neutral observer, who's a, who's a mediator, who can say, well, this is wrong, but you're also not looking at it clearly like this. And then he says, if that doesn't work, and the neutral observer, not somebody who's acting on your behalf, it's not like you take a lawyer in with you, but a, a neutral party who's, who's objective and who ultimately sees things fairly, if that doesn't work, then take, a, then take the church. Now, the church looks differently today than it did when Jesus was talking about that. So we're not going to invite somebody to sit up on stage here and be like, well, here's how you failed everybody and air it out in front of everybody, right? 
Because that's not the, this is not about shaming somebody. The goal here is to help somebody understand their need for their life to look like Jesus. And this is only done with people who follow Jesus. Because again, for people who don't follow Jesus, we expect their lives to look like hell. He continues in verse 6, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, spoiler alert, I am not a chef, all right? And understand, this, this word leaven, it's just the Old Testament word for yeast. And so he's using this to a crowd, an audience that understood the Old Testament. He's talking about yeast. Now, even though I'm not a chef, I understand that bread is made primarily of, of water, flour, and yeast. Tonight, they're anticipating anywhere from 13 to 15 million pizzas to be sold uh, across the country tonight which is going to invariably bring about the age-old debate, which is better, New York style or Chicago style, thick or thin. And I'm just going to tell you, it's pizza. You can't go wrong, all right? So you get angry, you debate your point, whatever, you, it's pizza. There isn't a wrong option or a wrong answer unless it has a cauliflower crust. And then... <laughs> I'm just telling you, Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Call flower pizza and go back to hell where it came from because it is not. It is not from God. All right? It is not. Domino's, Domino's Thin Crust Pizza, they, they boldly put it up on their website. Domino's Thin Crust Pizza, it has absolutely no yeast in it. No yeast. So this idea that the yeast, it impacts everything. It impacts everything in which it comes in contact with. And so it's, what, it's the agent that causes the bread and the dough to rise. And everything it touches in the baking process, it impacts. We don't, we don't have time to look at it this morning, but if you want to do some additional study this week, just write down Exodus 12, 15 to 20. Because following the Passover, where the, where the Israelites were delivered from Egypt, following that, there was a feast of unleavened bread. Moses was to instruct the Israelites for a one-week period of time to do no other work other than making food and remembering how the Lord delivered them from captivity in Egypt. And they, sec- they celebrated that with the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And here, Paul's saying, look back to that and remember how much more for those of us who follow Jesus have we been delivered. So you cannot tolerate this this yeast that's going to go about and ruin the whole batch. He says, how much more have those of us who have followed Jesus been delivered? So stop living like hell. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. And this is the mistake that historically a lot of Christians have made. They choose to judge the conduct of those who don't follow Jesus. They choose to avoid them. And that misses the whole point of what he's saying here. People who don't follow Jesus aren't going to act like Jesus. It's that simple. Stop being upset about it. That is the last thing in the world that you should be upset about. If that, if that is your expectation, your expectation is wrong. And I understand as a follower of Jesus, you have, your life has been changed and you have experienced love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control because these are all God working within us. And so you want that for everybody because of how it has changed your life. But you cannot live with the expectation for people who have not made the decision to follow Jesus to live like they've made the decision to follow Jesus. It makes no sense. So stop having that expectation on people. It isn't fair. It's not right. 
That's not our job. Our job is not to worry about people who don't follow Jesus, how they live their lives. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. If he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Why? Because there's this lie that we all believe on some level. And there's this lie that we believe that what we do doesn't affect anybody other than ourselves. And that's the lie we tell ourselves. That our our conduct doesn't affect anybody other than ourselves. And some of us really believe that. But some of you are the products of a parent who believed that. And so you grew up in a home that was absolutely shredded. Because one or both of your parents believed that their conduct didn't impact anybody else. It only impacted themselves. Some of you have been the victim of unspeakable things because somebody else thought, well, my conduct only impacts me and nobody else. And what he says is nothing can be further from the truth. And notice this list, how how specific it is. These are the parameters. These are the guardrails. It doesn't mean that every time somebody somebody who struggles with something that then becomes celebration, we're like, "Ah, nothing to do with you. Get out of my way. I'm pushing you out the door, handing you over to Satan. And by the way, probably don't use that language with somebody because it's just... (laughs) can be misinterpreted really easy, really easy. But these are the parameters. It doesn't mean that every time somebody messes up, we're like, get out of here. I want nothing to do with you. No, 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 no. And again, this only applies to people not who struggle with something, but who've moved to the point from a struggle to a celebration then don't miss this as he wraps up the chapter. He writes this. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? It is not those inside the church whom you are to judge. God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Again, evil person isn't somebody who's struggling. It isn't somebody who's struggling with sin. It isn't somebody who's struggling with an issue. It is someone who knows the truth, who's followed Jesus, and who said, I don't care. I don't care what the truth is. We're not talking about somebody who struggles with something. We're talking about somebody who celebrates it. This response never, ever, 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 ever applies to people who don't follow Jesus. I'm not going to tell you how to spend your money. That's on you. But I'm just going to encourage you. Don't waste your time trying to boycott organizations that don't agree with you. Because they're not Jesus followers. If you choose not to spend your money there, that's great. But that's not about the way to bring about change. And that's not what we're called to do. And historically, we've gotten this so backwards. So backwards. Here's what we need to do. First, let's look at ourselves. Look at ourselves. Because historically what we've done is we've looked out and we've seen everybody else. And what this is a call for us to do is to first look at ourselves. And if you struggle with something, I just want to encourage you, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Second. Look at those around us. 
after you've worked on yourself. Then you look at those around us, but never at those who don't follow Jesus. That's not our job. It's God's. So what do we do with all this? Well, first, we start looking inward. We look in a mirror rather than out a window. And what that causes us to do is it causes us all to see some things that we're not crazy about. And if you don't know where to start, ask your kids. They'll tell you. Ask your spouse. They've been waiting. They have just been waiting on the question. And then ask your coworkers. Start looking in the mirror. Stop looking out a window. Hold Christ followers, hold Christ followers to a higher standard than people who don't know Jesus. Stop judging people who don't know Jesus because they live like hell. They're going to. Realize your conduct matters, not just for you, but everybody's choices, everybody's actions have implications that go beyond themselves. Be willing to have hard conversations. Be willing to have hard conversations and administer tough love because, again, this is all about somebody's betterment and benefit. That's what it's all about. And help those who struggle. Help those who struggle. But distance yourself from those who know the truth and choose not to live like it and choose to celebrate that fact. The call for those of us who made the decision to follow Jesus is very simply this that our lives would look more and more like Jesus. And that's what this is all about. And the benefit of community is that we're here to help each other. We're here to push each other along. And we do that in a loving way, even when love requires us to have a hard conversation. For the betterment, of each individual. God, I pray that we would be people who love you well. I pray for the person here who's struggling. And I pray, God, they wouldn't give up. They wouldn't quit. I pray that this would be a place where they could find encouragement, people to push them along, to help them become more like you. I pray, God, that we would be a place where we would be invested in each other's lives and be willing to have hard conversations, even when they aren't fun, even when they aren't easy, but when they're desperately needed so they could be beneficial. I pray, God, that we would never be seen by people as as being judgmental. God, that we would stop looking at people who don't follow you and expecting them to live as though they did. And I pray that our focus would start on each one of us. I pray, God, that more and more as people look at my life and the life of people at Lakeside, they would see you and less of me and less of each person. And then I pray, God, you would take our lives And you'd use them for your glory. And you would accomplish things through us that we just have to shake our heads in awe at. And celebrate how good and loving you are. So Jesus, work in us individually and work through us collectively, we ask. In your name we pray. Amen.